Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. Good morning again. Okay, now I'm on. Okay. Happy Father's Day to the fathers. Okay. Happy Father's Day. And, um, <clears throat> you know, every day is Father's Day. Every day is Mother's Day. You know, we're told, honor our fathers and mothers. Okay? And some of us have had better fathers and mothers than others. Okay? But there's still something about what we learn from our mothers and fathers that have brought us to this day, that have brought us to the house of God, brought us to where we know who the authority is. We know who the Father is. We know who our example is. And praise God for that. Praise God for that. The title of my message today is going to be Four Pillars of a Man's Heart. And it's bringing strength into balance. There's strength that we as men have. I just think the women have too, but I'm focusing on the men today. And right up front, I'm going to let you know that I am basing this uh, on a lot of what I've gotten from a book called, amazingly, Four Pillars of a Man's Heart, Bringing Strength into Balance. So you can see where I got the title. By Pastor Stu Weber, who I actually got to speak to this week because he has a couple of things in here that I'd like to use. He called me back. I, I, I tried to get a hold of the publisher. Uh, whoever the original publishing company was was sold to another publishing company, was sold to another publishing company, was sold to another one. I ended up calling the church where he used to pastor, and he still helps out there. He's still part of the team. And just asked him, can you get me information on how I can get in touch with the publishing house? They called him. He called me and, uh, and said, Whatever you want to do with it, use it. Whatever you want to do. I, I highly recommend this book to you, okay? And one of the reasons why I do is, um, well, I'm going to read something. Well, I'm not going to read that. I'm going to go on. Uh, but because of the Proverbs 31 woman, okay, and how we're to look for her, how she needs to look, okay, for us as we seek here. Guys, I'm going to ask you to hold for one moment, Tim, Bill. Uh, before I get started, please stand if you can, if you're able. Please take a few silent moments and pray for me. Pray for the word that's coming. And fathers, I believe you've prepared my heart, my spirit. I pray for these who are standing, whether they're here, whether they're watching live, whether they see this later on in video, whatever. Father, open all of our hearts and our spirits to your word and to your word only. Touch us today, Lord. Let us be different when we leave. And let us be more like your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you. You know, we have the Proverbs 31 woman I was mentioning, tells us a lot of the character traits to look for in the woman that we're going to have as our wife, or the woman who is our wife already. But I believe from four pillars here, from this book, that it also gives us a summary from Proverbs of a man. Ladies, what to pray for for your husbands, what to look for in a husband, what to pray for for your sons, your sons-in-laws, your grandchildren, your grandsons, okay? That, that these are important facets of each one of us, just like Proverbs 31 is about the woman. When we build an edifice, a building of any type, uh, you know, and, and I'm out of my element here when I'm talking about this, so Tom can come up and correct me later on, that's okay. But, okay, uh, the first thing comes uh, after the plans and all that is we have to build a foundation, and then upon that foundation, that foundation needs to be solid, and upon that foundation, we need to, to frame the house and then frame the rooms so that we know this is where the kitchen is going to be, this is where the dining room is going to be, this is where the upstairs master bedroom is, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't really see them. There's just boards that are up there. And as, as progress goes on, okay, then they're gradually, uh, you know, filled in. We're putting the walls in and stuff. And, and, and you know, this is, this is very similar to creation. Uh, you know, in, in, cre in the creation story, uh, we get chapter one of Genesis. I'm going to be using chapter one, two, and three a lot today, okay? And God creates the heavens and the earth, okay? That's the foundation of everything, okay? That's the basis of where everything is going to be. And then he creates light, and day two, day three, he goes on. And he's building certain things. If I were to put it into a house, okay, I would say that he's not only framing the outside, but he's getting the kitchen framed. The bathroom is being framed in. You know where the bathroom is going to be. You know where that upstairs bedroom is going to be. You know where the garage is. All of those things are put in place, but they're not filled. They're serving no purpose yet. Okay? And on days four, five, and six, he fills them with what belongs in those areas. On day four, he fills what he created on day one. On day five, he, create, he fills what he created on day six. Or day, uh, on day five, he does day two. On day six, he fills what he created on day three. But who's it for? Who's going to get to enjoy it? Adam. Not just Adam the man, but Adam mankind. Upon his creation, Adam was like the first three days of creation, the framing times, mind, body, soul. But the framework needed to be filled. He needed to know how to use what he had already, okay? And he was created on day six after everything else had been created. He wasn't there. And then he was. And the Almighty, you can look, he's breathing into him the breath of life. He's giving him substance. He's filling him. What was the world like then? What was Adam like? Do you enjoy the smell of a freshly mown lawn? It's a great smell. There's a nice aroma to that. How about a flower garden that's in full bloom? Okay, you go there and you can smell the different varieties of the flowers. Or how about that moment when you hold that freshly born baby? Nothing like it. 
There's nothing like it. Adam, what was he like? He was masculinity in its pristine form. He was the man that we want to be. I want to read to you from the book here. What do you suppose masculinity was like when it was brand new? What did it look like? What did it smell like just out of the box? How did it perform when it was newly awakened, so fresh from the heart of its creator? The book of Genesis gives us a tantalizing glimpse, however brief. Within those first few sentences, we read what God had in mind for man before woman ever stepped so demurely off the design board. We hear God's instructions to Adam before there was Eve. And as the man walks through the morning splendor of a new planet, treading grass that has never felt the weight of man's foot before, he casts the shadow of four pillars. An infant wind slipping through newly minted leaves whispers, King, warrior, mentor, friend. What do these four pillars balance? What do they bring into, into balance for us? Well, the, the, the four pillars, we're going to find out what they are. I just mentioned them. But they're important for our marriage, our family, our church, not just this church, the true church, the true church for our community and nation. Pillar number one. I don't do these in exactly the same order that, that Pastor Weber does. I don't think he would have a problem with that. But pillar number one is the servant king. He provides. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained or perish. Okay? But happy is he who keeps the law, who keeps the instructions, the, the guidebook, the, the driver's manual for how to operate on the highway of, highway of life. We need vision. We get that from the king, who gets that from the king. The scripture I'm using here is basically based on the CJB, the, the complete Jewish Bible. Only thing really different about it is it uses Hebrew words transliterated into English for terms we're familiar with. Jehovah would be like Jehovah, or sometimes it's used as God, okay? So I'm going to be using some of those from it. here. You'll hear them. And this is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Please follow along if you wish. Okay, I don't have them up here, but check your word. Verify what I say. Don't just accept it because I'm up here and I'm saying it, so it must be true. You verify. Make sure I don't misstep. Jehovah God took the person and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and care for it. The Almighty gave the person this directive. You may eat freely of every tree of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You are not to eat from it. It will become certain that you will die. Remember, the woman hadn't been created yet. You are the supervisor of this garden. Cultivate it. Care for it. Enjoy its fruits. It's a kingdom. His kingdom. And kings have dominion. That's where the D-O-M comes from there. It is the dominion of the king. It is what he rules over. Stewardship of this realm was allotted to him by the Almighty, by the creator of everything. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. We've heard that before. Some of us who are old enough 
With kingship comes responsibility for both good and bad. It's on your watch. Be circumspect. Be circumspect. And I, make, I mentioned to my kids, I use that word in a purpose in a classroom. Circum, from the word that we use for circus. It's a circle. Spect, from spectacles to see. Look around. Be aware of your surroundings. Okay? When I'm on the ball field, that's easy for me. I've learned it. You know, I've learned that whatever position I'm in, I'm knowing where the other players are, what they're doing, what's going to happen if the ball's hit here or there or to me. But we need to be circumspect. We need to be prepared. We need to be aware, guys. We need to be aware. Faithful friend. Someone to connect with. Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not suitable for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Every creature that has been made so far, every plant, okay, in a sense, all beings have a mate. They have a way of associating. They have a way of reproducing. And there's Adam. And the Lord God brings all the animals to Adam. And Adam names them. Adam gives each one of them the names that they have. You know, the striped thing. We might call it a tiger. Okay? But he, you know, red bird. But I think he did that to let Adam come to realize that none of these was a helper that he needed. God knew that already. But this is revelatory to Adam. So he's put to sleep. And when he awakens, he sees one who is bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. She was like him. He now had a friend, a companion, to whom he was connected, and to whom he was connected before, but to whom he was connected, bone of bone, rest of, uh, flesh of flesh, the rest of the created works could not fulfill that role. Not Dino. Fluffy, Fido, Freebird. None of them could fulfill that. Third pillar, wise mentor. Matthew 28, 19. Now this goes into to individuals, but it also concerns corporately as well, and that's why I've chosen this scripture. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, how would Eve or anybody else become informed if Adam didn't share what the Creator had already told him. And we know one little thing that the Creator told him, but how much did he tell him? We have no idea. She's bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, but that's just the framework. God allows Adam to fill with the Word of God. Okay, to give her the knowledge, to give her the purpose of being. It was Adam's responsibility as a king, friend, and as a mentor to inform her of their purpose. And notice from Genesis 1, the end of chapter 1 in verse 28, <coughs> excuse me, 
what God tells both Adam and Eve. It says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky. And actually in the Hebrew it says, rule over the swimmers that swim and the flyers that fly. I love that. And over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth. And every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And from Genesis chapter 2, verses 16, 16 to 18, we can also see, and also using verses 21 to 23, we can also see that the God gave Adam the instructions about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil prior to Eve's appearance. Genesis 1 and 2, there, there's a, you know, we have to fit them together. You know, it's not all chronological in that order. The heart of a wise mentor, a teacher, was needed. How else was he going to find out? And, and apparently, as I presume we all know the story, Adam did not fully mentor his bride, at least not regarding one particular tree. Otherwise, I imagine she would have stayed away from it, especially since they were still in a sinless situation. Pillar number four, the tender warrior. It's the fourth pillar. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Now, I want to put forth to you something here that she's not looking at a snake in a tree. That's a term that's coming later on. If I told you today that, and some of you would know what I'm talking about and some of you would not, but if I said today that I want to go down to Pittsburgh and I want to, I want to visit Fort Duquesne, some of you know where I'm talking about, and some of you are like, Fort Duquesne in Pittsburgh? I, where's Fort Duquesne? I've never heard of Fort Duquesne in Pittsburgh. Until you would realize that I'm telling you something about the French and Indian War, where the French had a fort at the forks of the rivers, and it was called Fort Duquesne, and when the British came in and finally took it over, they changed its name to Fort Pitt. And if I said, let's go down to Fort Pitt and look at the old fortifications, you would understand. So to me, this is like saying Fort Pitt. But we're going down to look at what the fortifications for Fort Duquesne were. And the reason why I say that is because of what happens later on when we see that in Genesis 3, 14, later on in the story, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat the rest of the days of your life. I make an assumption, me. I don't have biblical proof for this. But I think she's seen the fallen angel. And I think he's there, and I think he's an angel of light. And I think he's saying, ah, this is good for you. This is wonderful. And maybe he has wings, arms, and legs. That's how we picture them. <coughs> Excuse me. But apparently, <coughs> whatever he had, by verse 14 in chapter 3, he lost them and was only able to crawl on the ground after that in subservience always to the Lord God, his maker. That's an aside. Back to the story. 
So the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. I read that. Okay, and you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? How sly. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Where's that coming? Okay, all it takes is a little twist, a little twist to get things out of shape, to get things out of line. And as Genesis 4 goes on to say, Adam immediately placed himself between the serpent and Eve, and he said, no, Eve. Jehovah did not say we could not touch it, but he did tell me we were not to eat from it. Let's go over there now. Well, that's not what it says. It's what I wish it said. Our lives would probably be a whole lot better if they had done that. And then Jehovah God called to. That word can mean summoned or encountered as well as called. He called the man and he said, where are you? Where are you? How many of us have said things like that before? Maybe using different terms. When sin destroyed the peace of the realm, God came looking for the man. Genesis 3, 1 through 19, records the tragic account of the first sin and its catastrophic results. It's worth noting that while the woman sinned first, when God came to confront the sinners, he came looking for the man. Scripture says, the Lord called to the man. King, we have the responsibility go into that a little bit more. But I believe the question God asked Adam was more of an indictment than a request for information. Where are you? I might say, what have you done? The Lord wasn't inquiring about Adam's physical whereabouts. He knew perfectly well, well where the man was on the ground. The omniscient God has no trouble with geographic locations. What he was actually doing was demanding an explanation. He was reminding the man of his abuse of the stewardship responsibilities for which he had been given. Adam had failed his Lord, his wife, himself. Guys, I dare say we've all been there. He had failed to steward his masculinity. I believe God was saying in effect, Adam, where were you? He was demanding to know just what Adam had done with his masculine stewardship. Where was the king in you, Adam? It appears you have not watched your home. You have failed to superintend your realm. Guys, don't think for one minute here that I'm here to make a condemnation because I'm thinking what we're getting here, what we're going to get from this is encouragement building up. So please don't think that. Where was the warrior in you, Adam? When that snake invaded your home, were you asleep on guard duty? Why didn't you stand between your wife and the evil in the world? Did you expect her to protect herself? Why didn't you step into the gap? Where was the mentor in you? When your wife was taken in by that snake, where were you? When your wife conversed with that evil one, where was your influence? Was she not alert to what I had told you earlier? Had you not given her that information? Where was a friend in you, Adam? When your wife was wandering off, giving attention to evil influence, where were you? Were you aloof, distant, absent, absorbed in your own stuff? Maybe for me, were you on your way to a softball game? Were you going to Saturday morning church to play basketball? 
Were you spending extra time at school? You didn't have to? Please note, God holds man responsible in a way in which he does not hold the woman. Okay? I'll go back. I jumped everything at once. Okay, that's fine. But we find out that it says that through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin. That's Romans 5.12. Through the man. Okay? It's not telling us that Eve sinned. Maybe she was deceived because she didn't know. It's still man's responsibility one way or the other. Whether you look at it as sin or deception, it's still man's responsibility. By the transgression of one, you could put Adam in there. The many died. Through Adam, through one. Through Adam's transgression, there resulted trans, there, uh, condemnation to all. Thank you, God, that that's not the end of it. Thank you, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Amen. There should be a chorus of amens out of that. We should be rejoicing. And we can start over again, so to speak. There are ramifications. There are changes. They're evicted from the garden. But we can go on doing what we know we're supposed to do. King, friend, Mentor, warrior. When Jesus was tempted in the desert and he was tempted with all the kingdoms, those kingdoms were to be Adam's to begin with and they weren't going to be the kind of kingdoms they were and are now. Jesus refused. Because he knows someday the righteous kingdoms are going to be his. He's waiting, he's waiting for the right time. And he used God's word to rebuke the enemy. Okay? And Adam and Eve did not do that. And that's a problem. In Deuteronomy 6. This is a charge, guys, for you and me. In Deuteronomy 6, it says this. It says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Yahweh or Jehovah, the Jehovah, that's the name of our God, okay, that the Jehovah your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. But they hold true for us today that you may fear the Jehovah your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Why is it only talking about sons here? You and your son and your son's son. Because you, meaning me, and you, and our sons, and our son's son, and so on, are supposed to be the king, the mentor, the friend, and the warrior for our wives as well. They're going to get it. But we have the responsibility. We have the responsibility. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them. Hear therefore, O believers of Jehovah. Believers of the Lord God. 
and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's the Lord our God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. I apologize to you that I have not done that. Things would have been different early on with the kids growing up, with where we are now. He's gracious, he's merciful, but I'm sorry. I apologize. I want to read you two last little portions. Well, one's little, one a little bit longer. When the man is at home doing his job, living out the four pillars of his masculinity, wrapping his arm around God's intentions for him, everyone wins. You know, we want to be a servant king, tender warrior, wise mentor, faithful friend. But you know what? We can be a coward as a king. We can be a bully. Okay? As a warrior, again, we can be a coward or we can be one that just goes out to fight. We can be a, a teacher but we can be one that you, I know everything, you've got to follow everything I say, or we can be someone that abdicates that, okay? Or the friend, we can be the, the absent friend, okay? Or we can be the smothering friend. But I want to read this to you. Some years ago, while speaking at a parenting conference with Dennis Rainey, Family Life's National Director, and the host, radio host of Family Life Today. And Ed, if you want to come up, please come on back up. I heard Dennis Rainey tell a story which moved my masculine heart to intense emotion and determination. Maybe it will encourage you too. In the mid-1980s, a missionary family serving overseas came home on furlough, needing a little R&R. &R. And through the graciousness of friends, they'd been provided the use of a summer home on a beautiful lake. Sound like anybody we know this week? <laughs> For these tired frontline warriors, it was like a little piece of Eden. One bright summer morning, mom was in the kitchen fussing with the baby, preparing a lunch for the family. Dad was in the boathouse puttering with something that needed some puttering. And the three children present were out on the lawn between the home and the edge of the lake, and three-year-old little Billy was under the care of a five-year-old sister and a 12-year-old cousin. When sister and cousin became distracted with some mutual interest, little Billy decided it would be an opportune time to wander down to the water and check out that shiny aluminum boat that had been bobbing so temptingly beside the dock. The trouble is, three-year-olds have little and have limited experience in getting from a stable dock into a bobbing boat. With one foot on the dock and the other stretching toward the boat, little Billy lost his balance and fell into five or six feet of water beside the dock. The splash alerted the 12-year-old who let loose a piercing scream. That brought Dad on the run. After scoping out the situation for a second or two, he dove into the murky water and began the desperate search for his little boy. But the lake 
Water was murky, and Dad couldn't see a thing. With lungs desperate for air, he resurfaced, grabbed another ragged grasp, and plunged back under, sick with panic. The only thing he could think to do was to extend his arms and legs as far as he could, try to feel little Billy's whereabouts. And having nearly exhausted his oxygen supply a second time, he began to ascend once more for a second breath. And on his way up, he felt little Billy. His arms were locked in a death grip around a post some four feet under the water. <coughs> Excuse me. Prying the boy's fingers loose, they burst together through the surface to fill their lungs with life-giving air. Adrenaline continued to surge. Conversation would not return to normal for a long time. Dad just carried Billy around, holding him close, unable to put him down for some time. Finally, when the heart rates had returned to normal and nerves had calmed a bit, this missionary dad turned to his boy with a question. Billy, what on earth were you doing down there, hanging on to that post so far underwater? And little Billy's reply, laced with all the wisdom of a taut, reaches out, grabs us all by the throat. Just waiting for you, Dad. Just waiting for you. Men, fathers, don't have to be a father. Men, if you come up here, social distancing, whatever, if you guys could all come up front, I would appreciate it if you feel comfortable with that. And Ed will do so in spirit. If you want to play something soft in the background, that's fine. You don't have to be a, a, a father to be a man. Okay? Ladies, if you want to come up, put a hand on your husband or boyfriend, whatever, if you just want to reach out from where you are, please do so for all of us. For all of us. Man, I think each one of us knows that within us there's a king. There's a mentor. There's a warrior, and there's a friend. And if they're all out of balance, then the covering we have over our home, over our wife, over our marriage, over our church, over our country is going to collapse. Let us seek to have pillars that are upright, Okay, and strong. Father Jehovah, we come to you in Jesus' name, Son of, name of your Son Yeshua. And Father, I ask that for each one of us, for each one of us, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us. Your Holy Spirit would cover us for each and every one. That it would guide us, not only be the comforter, but to be the teacher. And that we would have hearts and spirits that would listen, that would desire to obey, and that we would use that strength that you've already given us. And Father, thank you for the times when we do fall short. Thank you for the one king, warrior, mentor, and friend whose pillars always stay upright and upon whom we depend. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for that, Father. Stay here, guys, please. And as they dismiss us today, 
dismiss us with the blessing that Aaron was given by Moses to give to the people and that God the Father told Moses to use. And he says, and in this way, you will put my name on the people. I want his name on me. I want his name on all of you as well. And we pass that on to our wives, to our mothers, to our mothers-in-law, to our sons and daughters, and you know, so on down the line. Yivarechika, Yehovah, Beishmarecha. May Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yair Yehovah Panav Alecha Vichunecha. May Yehovah make his face to shine upon you and show you his favor. Isa Yehovah Panav Alecha Vichasem Lecha Shalom. May Yehovah lift up his face to you and you and you and you, 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 and me and all of us. Amen. Go in the peace of God. This is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church. I want to thank you for watching this video of our worship service. God is on the move, and we are so thankful. I'd love to invite you to join us Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock here at Zion Christian Church. I know that you would be encouraged by our worship and the ministry of God's Word. It's a wonderful group of people to be connected to. Why not join us this Sunday at Zion Christian Church? God bless you. Hello.